in the world, uh, or powerful films about uh, Frankenstein and other pieces. I have a bunch of text um, here that I have uh, spent the last hour and a half or so putting together. So hopefully it will, uh, it will do us justice. Um, it's been a great dialogue. Certainly a, a really powerful one. And remember, we started with this concept of cyberkinetic, and that's really been the backdrop of the last two days. How exactly are we thinking about impact, defense, deterrence? <coughs> and to quote a comment Wynn made on day one, when will we ever learn? Right? How do we learn from the past in order to go forward? And how do we think about these drones, autonomous systems, and other mechanisms in what I call innovations and the uh ovations that are likely to happen, right? Texas Chainsaw drones. I loved the control system of the gun attached to, you know, two drones attached to each other. Um, and how do we handle the acceptance of unexpected yet legal inputs? It is that, uh, that human element that is always so fascinating because they will think about putting these pieces and parts together in ways that the designers never imagined. But that's the real power of human innovations in this space and uh, ovations um, as we go forward. And so there was a lot, we have a lot of, uh, of talk um, about whether or not this is making a difference, right? how is this going to impact lives? How is this going to impact um, war fighting? How is the technology going to go forward? And if you've been following the world inside the Beltway, you've heard a great deal uh, about by the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary of Defense talking about their offset strategies. We, we talked about the industrial era and how we're offsetting the dramatic imbalance that's coming um, in terms of, of the cost of the attacker to the cost of the Defense Department to defend. And we have equated, we've, we've, we're just about at technological parity around the world. Right? The US used to have the advantage with nuclear weapons. It used to have the advantage with precision munitions. It used to have the advantage with network connectivity. Our, our, the, but the, the Western world, the concept from their perspective is that, that we're facing a need to offset that disadvantage again. And they are going all in, if you look at the FY17 budget, all in on this concept of autonomous deep learning machines, on the concept of an analytic capability growth, human machine collaboration, assisted human operations, advanced machine teamings, and semi-autonomous weaponry. Right? So we have huge investments in this country from our defense industrial base into this environment. And so I was really struck by that because it is that human component that is so vital. And it's that, uh, that sort of aha moment that happened yesterday, if you, uh, if you didn't realize it, where we talked about how do we create enough time and space to have a response that makes sense. How do we do this in a way that we, we recognize there's a, a need to, to respond quickly? There's a, a political pressure from the population that when one bad thing happens that you have to respond in a proportional way. Um, and it got us to thinking last night over drinks. I, I was uh, having a number of conversations testing out some of these, uh, these concepts. And it came down to how do we have a philosophical foundation for what we're talking about and what we're doing. And that pervaded today, right? That pervaded the whole afternoon and today. What is the philosophical foundation for what we're thinking? How does that guide decision making? How do we have a strategy about what we're doing informed in all of this? And I think that got summed up so beautifully yesterday by uh, one of our Swedish colleagues here, where they, he said, scared people make stupid decisions. Right? In one sentence, what's the philosophical foundation? Scared people make stupid decisions. Scared voters. Right? That's a, what, one of the things that's very real for us in this country right now because we're watching what's happening in the political sphere um, here. And so that got me thinking. If all of this is true, how do we succeed when there are so many aspects 
that need to be coordinated across a large spectrum of participants in such a rapid manner. Right? Think about the variables we're having to process just over the last two days, and certainly in our lives every day. How do we do this? And we actually answered that question. Right? Randy, you, you gave us the first step. What is that common narrative? In the conversation we were having about drones and uh, uh, swarming theory versus uh, asymmetry theory in this, how do we talk about the goals? I think, Dennis, you made that comment. What are the goals that we need to work towards? So how do we have that common narrative and that goal statement so that it lets us all function in this incredibly complicated environment? But are we thinking in the right way? Are decision makers thinking in the right way? How do we continue to question the how we think? How do we acknowledge and recognize that thinking is a learned skill and you can learn new ways of thinking and that we need to do that? Um, we talked about modularity and freedom of movement. Is that always good? It certainly seems always good. We think it's always good. Is there always a human on the other end? I hear that a lot in cyberkinetic kind of thinking, right? We're, we're talking about this in terms of, of autonomous systems, but, but there's a, a decision maker, a thinker on the other end. So I have to realize there's a human out there somewhere. If there isn't, or if there is, where are they really? And how do I impact them where they are to impact a, an action that's being taken someplace else? And so does this mean we have to, um, I think Hans yesterday made the comment about nonlinear thinking. How do we change the way we understand? We all have our sort of native thinking style. So how do we change the way we understand things? As we're in this moment that Scott brought forward, right? We're moving from an Enlightenment era culture to a new culture, as of yet unnamed kind of environment. What is it which being replaced with? And how are we in this room and all the other rooms with all the other people we're engaging with really shaping the thing that it's being replaced with? So we keep saying, and we heard it a couple of times here, right? This is about um, making people more aware of the threat, creating better coordination between government entities, between government sectors, across private entities. How far is this thinking going to take us? How does this relate to the cyber insurgency and counterinsurgency model? How do we think about it in the context of uh, private entities, privateers, and, uh, and what do you call it, digital blackwater entities? Who's got what roles? Who's got what responsibilities? Where are our individual roles and responsibilities fall? Who, how, when? How do we incorporate that into the narrative we tell ourselves, the ones we tell our allies, the ones we tell our adversaries? So what is war time anymore, right? We're in a world of false choices. And certainly, this is a false choice. Is it war? Is it peace? Is it black? Is it white? Is it good? Is it bad? What is it? We are in this world of false choices. And we have to break out of that con construct. Is it hybrid war? Is it political war? We're trying to name it. We're seeking handles, peacekeeping operations. How do we move beyond that? How do we describe the nuances that we're really in and involved in? And really interestingly, we don't understand, I think, what it means to win whatever this we're in. Right? Is win versus lose even the important thing? And from a conversation at dinner last night with a few of us, we were having this, this discussion about, is winning a temporal thing? Right? I have declared victory. It's good for this second. And what happens a second later? Right? And what happens a minute later? And what happens a week later, a month later, a year later, a decade later? And what does that mean in the way we are in the way we're thinking. Um, and so how does that, how does the concept of disruptive reorganization come into here? Right, we just heard, uh, heard that talk. We talked a lot around the edges on geography. So this is actually a quote from my now 16-year-old son. Uh -huh. 
why is it I have to take geography? The world is changing so fast, <laughs> I, it, it doesn't mean anything anymore, right? Now, mind you, I, he took geography, but, but it's a legitimate question, right? What does geographical boundary mean? Because how do we think about sustaining the concept of the state or the nation in a virtual context? Right, as those, those boundaries, the geographic pressures and boundaries and borders uh, go away in our minds, where do we create or establish this ideal? Um, a, uh, a little fact, if you didn't know, the nation of Estonia is working very, very hard, not just to be the most digitized government, but to establish and sustain Estonia once their borders are overrun. They acknowledge and know that this is a reality for them and want their identity to pervade. I think about a Star Trek episode, right? Think about what this might mean. And so what, what are the contexts of this in this autonomous uh, system world? And how do we deal with the dynamic interactions of constantly changing sets of problems? Patterns, patterning patterns as we are evolving from this enlightenment area, this industrial-based concept into the future, that dynam dynamicism that we have to work with. Because within that is that chaos. And we've been reminded that chaos creates space. And volume, intensity, and complexity of information does not equal intellectual value, right? really have to think about this. And I, I, I know in my, uh, in my day job, I face this all the time. Who are you trying to talk to? What are you trying to get across from them? Don't tell them what you know. Tell them what they want to know. Right? Bridge that gap here. And how do we think about filling that space? I was so thrilled by last night's conversation about we can fill that space with art. Right? We can fill that space with positive things that we don't realize are happening. But we have to be. We have to recognize, we have to do it in a conscious, strategy-based, intentional engagement with the narrative. We don't have that. We're just filling the space with more chaos. We're creating more room for counter-narratives that we don't want. And so this isn't going to make any sense, but I want you to take a minute and look around in this room. There are 43 participants. There are four women. The power of diversity in this problem is vital, right? We cannot keep thinking that the way we got here will get us out. And so whatever the diverse opinions, conversations, perspectives you can find is really important as we, uh, as we go forward here. Again, struck by the fact that so many of the artists that were speaking out were women in oppressive environments. And so to take a quote uh, here from uh, you know, one of uh, all of our potentially favorite movies uh, in terms of the truth, and the quote last night, art is the closest lie to the truth. We spent a lot of time in sort of the underlying thematic here, talking about facts versus truth versus reality versus perception, right? We are back in that false choice, right? Facts are a false choice. If I want to counter the thing that people are saying and talking about, I'm going to give them facts. It's true or it's false. Perception flags reality in that space. Technology is going to kill us, right? We heard that from the Frankenstein theory, right? That's the, the Frankenstein premise. What is the evidentiary base of security? And it's not a technological base, right? Is there a mathematical proof that we can be secure? Absolutely. Is there, a math, is there a proof, a human, a human proof, that we can operate in a secure manner, whatever that looks like for a nation, is the real question. And what does our role in the global economy really look like? The other thing that was thematically true about the last two days is everything old is new again, right? It's happened before. Putin's words have happened before. Doesn't mean they're going to be exactly the same. We have to acknowledge that it's only going to last for so long. And it's not necessarily true everywhere. But there are patterns we can use as we're defining the new patterns. 
People said the darndest things over the last couple of days, right? So please insert your credit card now. Is this a swarm theory or an autonomous system theory problem? Who's making the bets? Who's putting money into these problems? What has their track record been in terms of picking the right side? How do we really think about that? And then figure out what the alternative bets might be. What, how do we affect that work factor attacker cost, right? That, there's real promise in that, that we can really impact. And then I don't think uh, any conversation uh, about the global nature of anything would be really uh, complete if we don't talk about uh, this challenge, right? How do we handle migrants? It is a very real, very pressing, very human situation. And Scott this morning said, I'm not sure it's possible to assimilate near border entities into the environment. The next billion people that are going to connect to the internet are not the enfranchised. They're the marginally franchised and the disenfranchised. And so they're going to find people who think like they do, who are, they're going to find narratives that they resonate with. And that's going to change all kinds of things. That democratization of the access to technology and the desire of the Luddites and the neo-Luddites, as, as uh, Colin reminded us, to try to hold on to their elite status. How do we ensure that there is a place out there to release that pressure instead of continue to engage? Because innovations are going to happen, and they're not going to happen in expected ways because of this particular pressure. Which brings us back to the very human component of this. It is the narrative in the narrative in the narrative, right? It's how do we put this together? Because computers and computing are articulated through that worldview. I used to be the chief information officer of a large information technology agency. And regularly, people would say, the IT system sucks, right? Why is it so bloody hard to do this? Or why can't that one talk to this one? And my answer is, the organizational culture stinks. And the computing is just a reflection of the organizational view. That's a truism as much as anything else. But it was a reality there. And so our picture of computers and computing is articulated through our worldview. Everyone else's is articulated through theirs. And so it's going to put pressure on organizational models and that familiarity and reality comment. And wh where and how do we put forward those uh, supporting narratives, alternative narratives in this space, that human component, because it takes that interdisciplinary model and that interdisciplinary environment. So I realize I did no one's individual uh, uh, topic justice here, and I take all kinds of welcome, all kinds of feedback on how, how to put this forward. But it was my intent to really make sure that, uh, that I, uh, I uh, did my best to uh, value your input, uh, and I certainly enjoyed listening to it over the last couple of days and hope this uh, put forward a perspective of how it all came together.